Welcome to your Innerverse. Greetings, newbie Innerversers and veteran Innerversians. My name is Chance. And I'm Haley. Today, this is uh, Season 3, Episode 9. We're talking to a new friend that we made when we were on our trip back from California. Uh, if you maybe remember a few episodes back, we talked about our journeys there in June. And uh, yeah, where were we? How did we meet Linda? We were on the plane ride back and we had um, her right next to us in the seat and just kind of started talking about life immediately really we had a really long conversation with her and it was from the flight uh to phoenix from yeah we stopped in phoenix on the way back from san francisco and i don't know exactly what got the conversation so opened up to a amazing level but other than that linda's just a really epic human being and it's such like a shining bright radiant brilliant person that in if you're anywhere near her and paying attention you'll probably want to talk to her but, she's like an enzyme because yeah. she speeds up reactions she gets she gets people on track and speeds up their lives so that they can get momentum to where they need to go <laughs> uh so she's basically a life coach or what you call a mentor uh her business model is a little different than other people's she's really not trying to do anything specific that is the same for every person she's more customizable <laughs> she's actually helping other people figure out their goals and dreams and how to execute those things so it's different for everybody there's a lot of people who i have asked um what what is your dream or what do you want to do and so many people just say i don't know um, about that and about what their interests are. So clearly that's something that we need is, is someone who will act as a tool for introspection, introspection, I guess you could say someone who can kind of guide people towards getting to know themselves, which is what she helps people to do. Yeah. It's someone that can hold space or maybe even hold someone's hand through difficult aspects of changing their life so that they can actually become the manifestation of what they desire to see changed in the world, which is something we're all trying to do, whether it's through our art or our writing or our music or just our just trying to be a good person at our job or treat our families more nice. And she's definitely been through her share of big changes in life. So that's kind of given her the tools to help people in this way because she's been through it and she came out at least uh, from what I can tell, a pretty amazing human being. Yeah, so it's, it's a story that involves a lot of hardship, but illumination through the hardship. And it's really cool to hear how even for people that have what you might call bad luck, it turns out that these are actually just tests of the spirit that allow the truly strong among us to rise to an entirely new level of achievement and being and self-discovery. And in life, you've always got the choice to rise above or give in. So people who always choose to rise above end up helping others in the end, which is what happened here. And a good way to actually find yourself rising up is to go out of your way to help others. And so what better way to do that than by donating to Patreon for Interverse? Uh, if you are not familiar with what Patreon is, it is a website where you can crowdfund whatever it is that you're into. Whether there's an artist that you like or a musician, they get to set up a tiered reward structure based on your choice to donate however much or how little you want. And so over at patreon.com forward slash interverse, there are some rewards ready for you to check out. And even if you can't spare a dollar a month, don't forget to get on iTunes and download the show because it is available there as well as being available on SoundCloud. Yeah, whenever you go to iTunes, it makes me happier than a cat in a cradle to have you subscribe and give a show a five-star rating because the more of you do that, the more people end up finding the show. So yeah, don't forget to subscribe. You can also find a video version of this episode on YouTube. If you're already watching it on YouTube, 
hold tight, there will be video soon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's the places you should be subscribing. And we will be in touch, my friends. On to the episode. All right, uh, everybody, welcome to the show. Linda Clay. Linda is a life coach and mentor. Um, what she does for people is help help others actually get their ideas off the ground and help others do what they are here to do. So, uh, perfect candidate for the type of stuff we like to talk about here, which would be, you know, how do you do things for yourself and get yourself out of the patterns you're stuck in with, uh, you know, the skills and abilities and interests that you already possess. Uh, how are you doing today, Linda? We met on a plane, by the way, guys. So you never know who you're going to run into in a, in a plane conversation. That's awesome. That's true. Hi. Thank you so much, Chance and Haley, for inviting me to be on your show. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I love what I do. And you hit the nail on the head when you said, I help people kind of figure out what they want to do. I just finished a beta round of my five day um, tapping into you challenge, which was, it was the second round actually. And it was so insightful because it allows people to really go deep into themselves. And that's what's missing in our everyday hectic life. We just never have time to really ah, sit and be and figure out what it is we want to do. So totally that's jazz. Completely true. Um, what kind of techniques are involved in, in that? Um, I personally have harped on this a lot in the past on the show is just meditation uh, being a really important mode for consciousness to actually be able to expand past the boundaries that we're constantly being forced to navigate through mm -hmm. um, in our normal waking experience. But then beyond just meditation, there's a modality of thought that is even further removed from us because it involves the use of the imagination, which would be right. just pure contemplation. Right. Like giving someone people actually kind of need prodding or structure even to, to fall into that mode yeah, as opposed to, you know, when we were children, we could just daydream endlessly about what we liked. Right. And, you know, you bring that up and, and the first, the pre kind of creative exercise I have people do before the challenge, I'm getting ready this week to launch it. So it goes out to the masses. But the first thing they do is they do what I call a push the umbrella exercise and they get a sheet of paper that they print off it has an umbrella in the middle of it and then around that they start creating and writing down all the dreams that they can remember from the time they were the littlest being they could be to the adult they are today and um, I did it before and in my video I share with them that like one of the things that I wanted to be so bad when I was a kid was a Mouseketeer I mean I just you know that was what you wanted to be you wanted to be Annette or you wanted to be Karen or whatever and um, my realization as I went through the exercise is that I actually did become a mouseketeer because I got my mouse ears when I went to Disneyland. So that officially, then you become one, right? <laughs> and um, the other thing I wanted to do was run a restaurant. And don't ask me why, but my parents would go on these road trips and they would take us up 99 from Seattle to Vancouver and we'd see these roadside cafes and they would, you know, I'd go, I want to have one. I want to have one. Well, as an adult, I ran a small kind of diner type um, cafe in a bowling alley. And I did the ordering and I did the cooking and I planned the meals and I planned, the, you know, all that type of stuff. And so when I went through the whole process of putting everything around the umbrella, I realized that every dream I ever had, I actually reached. I just reached it, not necessarily in the form that I had when I was originally dreaming about it, if that makes sense. So that's the first exercise they do prior to the five day challenge. It's to get that imagination you're talking about, bring it back out, be a child again, look at all those things that you wanted to do. I mean, how exciting is that? If you wanted to be a ballerina, then, you know, you have that opportunity now to be it just maybe in a different form. And who do you mainly gear it, gear it towards? Your coaching? So my coaching? Um, mostly, I find that mostly women entrepreneurs or maybe mompreneurs that, um, because women tend to be the caregivers, so they tend to spend most of their lives taking care of other people. And by doing that, they kind of forget who they are. 
They put all their stuff kind of in that back shelf in the back of their mind. And they've kind of lose touch of who they are. How do I know that? Because I did. <laughs> I mean, I raised two families, um, my own two daughters, and then my granddaughter. And I woke up one day and I was probably 63. And I started crying. I said, who the hell am I? I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what I liked because all I remember doing is watching Disney movies and going to McDonald's. I mean, that, you know, when I'm as a caregiver, that's what you do. You spend your time watching their shows. You spend the time eating their types of food. And so at that point, I started redoing my life again, rediscovering who I am. I made a decision and it was scary to pack my bags and go to Portugal for six months. And so I went there by myself and lived for six months. My sister joined me towards the end and we did some traveling, but it was the best experience because it gave me a chance to kind of reconnect again with who I am. So you got, you got you away from all the hectic um, right. enforcement of responsibility that is so easily, so easily accumulates in our life, but is really hard to shed Right. Once we gain those those layers of uh, things that we have to take care of. And what's funny is if, you know, any one person, no matter how important they were, just dropped dead, um, everything that was on their to-do list that was so urgent that it was life or death to them, it would either happen in a different way or it wouldn't happen and it would be fine. So you can right. always just like, you can always just stop and not take things so seriously. But um, it's amazing to get out of the country for that kind of thing. I imagine, I guess I've only been out of the country for a few days at a time, but even that was a huge uh, relief, <laughs> a, a real recuperation. So I can't, right. can't imagine what six months was like. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty amazing. And I did learn, I have to, to your point of we, in fact, I just had somebody say something to me about how um, her motto is don't sweat the small stuff. And that was, you know, a book written years ago. And, it's like how much as individuals, we will sweat the small stuff. We will spend hours and hours and hours worrying about little things that really in the end aren't going to matter. And I didn't understand that. And my husband died um, when he was 49. He was right before his 50th birthday. And that experience taught me that the little stuff doesn't matter. That And not that I am perfect because I'll catch myself now just kind of stressing about it off and on. But really, to ask yourself the question, will this matter five years from now, makes a huge difference because 99.9% .9 of what happens in life won't matter five years from now. You know, it's just in that moment that we're kind of like angst and, and that. But yeah, I would recommend everybody to travel. Well, what kind of stuff really did you get up to in Peru? In Peru, no, Portugal. Portugal, um, right. Well, yeah, that's off, wrong, wrong <laughs> continent. Yeah. First off, I didn't know the language at all. So that was really interesting. But the very first person I stayed with had, I got a room um, in a house with a Portuguese woman in Kishkais, which is outside of Lisbon. And she was just awesome. And so she really helped me kind of adjust to things. And she helped me because originally I was going to take out a residency for a whole year. And she helped me get that started. And, um, but I just spent my days taking walks and doing the work that I had to do. And then I'd go for a walk and I'd just sit and watch people and just really be, you know, I didn't have pressures of children and adult children and, you know, a job or anything really loading me down. I could just really kind of get back to who I am. It took a while and I was afraid of a lot of things. I mean, I'll be honest, get on a, metro in Lisbon and you don't speak the language and you're trying to figure out how do I know when to get off? <laughs> so, um, but I learned that the signs were color coded so I could tell which sign was what. And I learned that the words, the base words are the romantic languages. So, and I could remember enough of my French to be able to pick out, you know, if I was on the right track or if I, that. And so I never got lost. It was awesome. Um, different foods. Uh, the people are absolutely amazing. They are so relaxed and they smile all the time. They're not at all like the U.S. at all. 
that in itself was such a treat. Yeah, I bet. I, I would love a I would love a a town where people were smiling all the time. I never see that. Well, you know, my one of my favorite stories from that time, and it really it helps to put things in perspective in life. But I get on the train, and I had taken a, a weekend trip up to the north end of Portugal, and um, in Porto, this young lady got on the train, and she had just we started talking, and um, she had just graduated from the university. And she was heading back home to be with her parents. And so we started talking and she was telling me how she was a speech therapist and she couldn't get a job in that field. There were no jobs available. She couldn't get a job at a hospital or anything. You kind of like have to put your name on a list and wait till somebody dies or retires. And, but then she told me, she said, but even then she said, I would have to work a second job. So I'm thinking in my head, oh my gosh, speech therapists in the United States get, I don't know, they get a really good salary. So here's this young lady that spent four plus years becoming one, can't get a job, wouldn't even make enough because the average wage in Portugal is 600, and 600 euros, which is about $650. And they and like, a, a, like a month? A month. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's not much. It's no. weird too because there's got to be so many more people that actually are in need of speech therapy or any kind of specialized therapy that are actually receiving it through um, either socialized healthcare or insurance-based healthcare. Mm -hmm. those, those systems are actually bottlenecking not only the amount of people that want to be caregivers, but also the amount of people that can receive care. Right. Just because right. of the hoops that we decide that we have to jump through to actually give a shit about each other, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we talked to you about the, uh, you know, when we met on the plane, I'm sure we told you about the caregiving uh, story of our friends, Colin and Finn. Right. And, yes. Um, they actually gave Haley a call today and they were getting ready to go camping for a week. But that's a, uh, that's a situation where, um, it, it's gotten really weird because I like the Colin's not getting paid to be a caretaker anymore for, um, I guess I won't go into the details on that, but mm -hmm. you know, it's still like completely necessary that Finn continues getting that type of 24 hour care. And, wow. um, you know, that's kind of the hard, the hard reality of human existence is that, uh, if we want, ourselves to be cared for, then we're going to have to step up and be caregivers for right. each other. Mm -hmm. and right. Yeah. And in our country more so, I think, than some of the European countries, because their system is set up a little bit, you know, differently. I mean, I, I work with a client that um, has some disabilities and she has a care that comes in and it's supplied by the state or the government, not in Portugal. She's in another country. So, you know, that's, that's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but, um, anyway, the experience in Portugal was really a huge eye opener and really made me appreciate a lot of the things in the United States, like vegetables. Um, they don't eat a lot of vegetables there. So, but really? when I, came back, I couldn't stop eating them. I just, yeah, they use them for soups. They don't use them like we do here where you have, you know, like a, if you, if you eat meat, you'd have a piece of meat and you'd have your vegetables. Or if you're a vegetarian, you eat just all vegetables, but they make a soup out of them, but it's a, um, cream based soup or it's more of a puree. Oh, I'd say. So um, what did, did they eat just, um, a lot of carbohydrate like uh, grains and things there right. and bread or right so you'd go and you'd get your dinner and you would get like fish or meat pork beef I think they're bigger pork eaters chicken and then you'd get rice and then you'd get potato chips but they're not oh. potato chips like we have here um they're ham homemade potato chips so more starch and that. Now my understanding, and I could be wrong, but somebody told me it really came from the time when they were ruled by a dictator. And so he controlled everything. And so one of the things is they didn't have a lot of vegetables to eat under that regime. So um, they use it for other things now. It's, uh, it's one of the first things that power structures will do to suppress the yeah. you know the groups of people is to take control of the food and okay. weaken the people through that it's yeah 
it's crazy how people aren't even seeing seeing that for what it is in our country right now, despite the fact that I mean, I was at a I was at a public event the other day and I was probably being a little judgmental, but I was just like noticing the large degree of people that seemed out of shape, disproportionate to their age, especially. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking like how much of that would be completely averted if they just had clean food and um, knew the difference between <clears throat> why you should eat it and why you shouldn't, I guess. No. And you you know what, that's a good point because you don't see that issue as much in Europe at all. I mean, mm -hmm. it was very rare to see, unfortunately, you know, it's unfortunate that our country, we have, I guess you could say in a sense, a lot of drawbacks were so big. So if you look at Europe in general, it's so small. So they're more condensed. They're able to walk places easier. In some of the cities in the United States, you can't walk to the grocery store because it's just not feasible to do that. So you drive. Okay, there's a downfall. The more you drive, of course, the less you're walking. Um, some of it could even be in relation to how animals, um, what do I want to say, modify who they are based on their size, like a fish will grow large. If it's in a large tank, it stays smaller. If it's in a small tank, a tank. and if you look at the United States, we're so big that our, the humans here are bigger than the humans are over there. I was watching um, a video today and I didn't see the citation on this, so I don't know if it's actually true, but the video was saying that in, um, I believe it was Korea, the average weight of any, any gender, any height, just the average weight is 133 mm -hmm. pounds, but in the United States, it's actually 180 pounds. So could, yeah, as, especially compared to certain other countries, we yeah. really are big people. Yeah. Well, you know, and I went, I just finished a two and a half. I think when I met you guys on the plane, I was on my way to Phoenix and my sister and I were going to do that road trip. And so we went to, um, Canyon de Chez, which is, you know, a sacred canyon of the Navajo people. And the first Ana, Ana Aussies were there and they were small. They did not get but like four feet tall or something. They were tiny. So originally the people that inhabited our land, the original people, <laughs> were very small. And so now, you know, we have what? Basketball players at over seven feet. Yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah, you know, and so you don't see that, whoops, in Europe at all, seven feet tall people. So I think it has to do with our land mass and how big it is and probably our food, you know, the I, antibiotics and the hormones that we put in it. And I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Lots of growth hormone. If uh, Usually if you, if someone consumes, um, especially beef and dairy, even mm -hmm. that is, mass produced it's probably got a lot of uh, growth hormone right so one of the one really telling thing is that my my grandson um was playing played soccer a couple of years ago and two men from soccer players from england came over and my daughter was talking to them and they said they can't eat mcdonald's here because it makes them sick to their stomach but they can eat mcdonald's in england and that's because England doesn't allow the stuff that we allow in food here. Wow. And so that is one of the things that I noticed is I actually felt better over there. Um, now, I did a heck of a lot of walking because I went everywhere. I didn't have a car. I just used public transportation on my two feet. But the food tastes better, and I felt better. And I know it, it was in relationship to that. Yeah, and... Um Kind of, your metaphor before about the people, the goldfish in the container with uh, <laughs> people here being larger, but there being more space. I think that one sense that that metaphor definitely applies to would be um, in our actual consciousness. If if we're kept in a small container, whether that's in the uh, environment that we are able to actually access or the or if we're really limited in what we can think about or what we do think about in a daily basis, it it's like yourself shrinks down smaller and smaller. And it sounds like going to Portugal allowed you to uh, grow into a much larger 
size of selfhood. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting what it. What kind of stuff, what did you, what did you rediscover about yourself while you're there uh, that, that you had was, forgotten? Well, first off, it was, it was, I was doing, my original online business was a virtual assistant business consultancy. I was basing it on the business background I had had. And I was looking at it more as, um, I thought it was a quick fix, I guess you could say. And so I, but I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. I did it well, but I didn't enjoy it. I had clients and stuff. So I get to Portugal and I'm doing that work. And then all of a sudden, all these people are asking me for advice. And I'm going, wow, this is so much more fun. You know, brainstorming, helping people figure out things, being able to listen to, the, to their challenges and being able to pull out a solution had they, that they hadn't tried. And so it dawned on me when I was over there, away from, I really, to be honest, away from all the pressure that the U.S. has. We have a lot of stress, a lot of pressure in our country. And it was like, wow, this is what I should be doing. This, I should be helping people this way, not, you know, regulating somebody's email inbox, if that makes sense. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I, that idea was planted there. It, I guess you could say it freed me up enough to see that. You know, we're given signs all the time, but sometimes our stress in our life kind of clouds our vision and we can't really see, you know, what we should be doing. So it made me more conscious of watching for signs of realizing there's other ways to make a living versus doing what would be more standard kind of thing. Though a lot of people love VA work and I, good for them. But, and I really, really admire strong VAs. I know a lot of them and they love it, but I'd rather sit and help somebody put pieces back into their own puzzle. If that makes sense. That's a really awesome way of putting it actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I mean, I hope to do a similar thing with conversations like this because uh -huh. Um, you're a perfect example of how what someone's soul passion might be, cre you know, creatively speaking, it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily look like what you thought it would look like or what you thought um, or what other how other people are expressing. There's right. not really a wrong way. And especially when the motive is truly oriented around how can I be of service to others? Um, you know, and if that is your goal, there will be opportunities and you'll have signs to find those opportunities like you're describing pretty much one after the other, as long as you keep in motion there. Right. Right. And I do, I do feel that, you know, I, I wrote this down as a, a something to remember, to remember to say, because I think it's important. I've had numerous challenges in my life. I mean, they can, they range all the way back to being a child of an alcoholic and so my whole life has been, you know, like a challenge after a challenge. There's been periods of calm, but then something else would come up. And I would have people say, why does everything always happen to you, Linda? I mean, you could write a book. You've had so much crap going on in your life, you know, and you hear that and you step away and you go, oh, God, you know, what is wrong with me that I keep getting all these things? And finally, it clicked in my head that I was given those things because they gave me strength. They gave me a gift of intuition. They gave me the insight that I need to help other people. So I don't share my background for the poor pitiful pearl me kind of thing. I share my background because I want people to know that no matter what you go through, there's a path you can find to get through it and you will get through it. And I can't, I can't express enough that it's really a gift. It's a gift to be given hard times. It's a gift to be able to make it to that other side. Because if you just have a piece of cake of life and then something hits you, it's like double whammy. I had it my entire life. So, <laughs> you know, that's what I'm worried about. I've had a really easy life. I feel like I'm, I'm due for something crazy. Oh, uh, it doesn't, it could be anything. I mean, there was that one, what I call my WTF year. And that yeah, was, explain that, please. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, that was the year that my husband died. He got he was diagnosed with um, cancer, 
in, okay, the time frame is a little fuzzy, but it was like April. And they started treatment and they did all that type of stuff. And he wasn't getting any better and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. So he finally ends up in the hospital because his feet had swollen up so bad. They were like elephantitis and the skin was breaking. So we took him to the hospital and the doctor said, you've got to stay in. So they started looking for reasons why, what's going on. Well, they found that he had a different kind of cancer. So he had two kinds of cancer. Um, so at that point, it was, we can't give him chemo for one because it won't work on the other one. And we can't give him on the other one and it won't work on that. And we can't give him double doses. It'll kill him. And I just said, well, then take him, I'll take him home. And so I spent the last 10 days of his life nursing him because he didn't have an official, our hospice system at the time, this has been like 19 years, um, would not could not come to the house because there was no official diagnosis that he was terminal because his multimyeloma was not terminal. It was the other cancer that was. So they had to get the, um, they had to get the official diagnosis before hospice could come in. So here's Linda. All of a sudden I'm playing a nurse and I'm changing his IVs and I'm fixing his ulcerated sore and I'm doing all these things in kind of that, that um, self-preserve mode you go into, you're in shock and you're just kind of like doing things automatically. So we get through that and within two weeks, my oldest daughter tried to commit suicide and I found her. And so that was, I hadn't even adjusted to one situation, let alone now here's another one. So that year I had those two situations. My mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. My boss at the time in this career that I absolutely loved was kind of like undermining me and made me come back to work within three weeks of my husband's death. And um, it was Christmas time in retail. What can I say? <laughs> so I had to, you know, I mean, you're just like, boom. And then um, I ended up having to kick out my oldest daughter and I took over raising my granddaughter who was two and a half at the time. So I became a single parent. So it was just like one crisis after another um, that I went through. And yeah, I ended up crashing and burning. I went into severe depression for two years. I suffered from PTSD because of the trauma. People tend to think that PTSD comes, you know, you have to be a sh soldier in battle. Well, all of us are soldiers in battle when we're facing some type of traumatic experience in our lives. You don't have to be in Iraq. You can be right in your own home, you know. Simply losing a loved one is enough yeah. to right. generate that kind of trauma. Yeah. And I, you know, had the benefit of a really great counselor. And she told me, she said, I'm not even sure how you're walking. She said, because most people, just one of those circumstances would put them over the edge and you had five, you know? And so it taught me a lot about myself now that I'm on the other side. It took me a while to get on the other side. Um, but I totally understand how easy it is um, to fall to depression, to learn, not to learn, to let your depression play mind games with you because it does. Um, you know, the, the, how easy, well, it's not easy. I don't want to say it that way. When you're in that black hole, there is no future. There is nothing but this black hole and you just sit there. I mean, I can honestly chance and Haley remember sitting on the couch, um, and watching these cars go by and it was kind of like they were going by in slow motion. And I was just sitting there watching and crying going, but don't you understand my whole world's gone? Because my husband, we had been married 28 years. He was my best friend. And, um, you know, you go, I didn't allow myself because I had to go back to work to be able to go through the grieving process correctly. And that's kind of what happened later that year when I crashed. Yeah. I just kept it on. Whenever there's any kind of situation that we can feel victimized by or, um, a situation that is flat out abusive to us, we oftentimes get tricked into thinking that there's only two choices, which is to become 
a victim or become an abuser and right. identify with one of those things. And it's very hard uh, to, it's very hard to see um, past that identification once it's made and it puts you in a cycle where you wind up mm -hmm. being set up for the exact same thing again in a different way. Right. And you basically <clears throat> have to go through it, not around it in a revolution, but actually through the middle of it, that like mm -hmm. to the core of the experience and um, really ob observe your own self in it. I mean, I can't even really imagine this, the, the reality of how heavy that situation would be, honestly, like I, I have a lot of words about that, about <laughs> depression, but like that's beyond my ability to comprehend. I'm only speculating. Yeah. That's probably one yeah. of those things. All of those life experiences are things that you just can't understand unless you've been through it. Right. I'm sure. Cause I can't right. personally. Yeah. And no, and they, and that's what I think when I go back to my comment about these things being a gift, they have given me the ability to understand that we are all susceptible to depression. I mean, it's just your mind, you just take on so much all of a sudden you just like, uh, I'm done. I can't, I can't do it. And the universe stepped in, in my case, I mean, I had a lot of great experiences actually, um, insightful experiences going through that, um, through the process, some spiritual ones. And finally, I, I basically woke up one day and I had been applying for social security disability, which is not easy to get. People think it is, but it really is not that easy to get. And um, they denied me and said I could work at McDonald's. And it was just like, oh, wow. You know, and here I was, had been a store manager, was, you know, making a decent salary and all this. And all of a sudden they're going, no, but you can work. You can go to work at that time, what, eight bucks an hour or something like that. And so I woke up to the reality, literally, and realized, oh, my God, I have no income. My two years of disability through my company were gone. I can't get Social Security disability. I don't qualify for unemployment. I'm going to lose my house. What am I going to do? I mean, I literally, it was just like I went to bed one night and I woke up and I went, and it was like the universe was saying enough is enough, Linda. You've had your pity party. It's time for you to get your ass up up and you know move forward rise so, from the ashes like yeah, a phoenix <laughs> that's <Wow>. right <laughs> and so and i've done that a lot in my life and um so i did i sold my house on a short sale i went and lived with my brother and his family for only a few months i spent eight hours a day sending out resumes and i had a job within like two or three months maybe i packed up everything i owned and moved my granddaughter and myself to Idaho Falls and work there. And it was not um, the right environment for me. So I contacted my old boss at my former company and I got a job in New Hampshire. And my granddaughter and I and a friend drove across country and I went to work and lived there for a year. I didn't know anybody, I just did it. And that whole process moving across country taught me so much about myself and it helped me regain a lot of confidence because when you go through depression, you lose your self-confidence because those little chitty chatty voices and we all have them. They're just not as bad when you're not depressed as when you're depressed and that I was really a really good store manager, but I had to move across country to figure that out. <laughs> and once um, Yeah, go ahead. Did having your granddaughter, help motivate you to pull yourself up in that regard? Yeah. If I didn't have her. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had to keep going. I mean, that's, so I never, um, even though I suffered from major, they called it major clinical depression. I never had deep suicidal thoughts because that's not in me. I mean, I was raised that you just keep going. So I think, and I look at my depression as like, I needed a timeout. I needed a timeout from all the pain and all that to get to the other side and to learn more about myself. Um, but if I didn't have my granddaughter, I don't know what would have happened. So yeah, I, I credit having her as being one of my um, motivations, I guess. Yeah. One question I'd like to uh, return to actually would be a little bit of elaboration on some of the maybe hard to explain 
um, or spiritual aspects of experiencing the loss of a spouse that was that close and, you know, in what ways maybe you were possibly uh, communicated with or that you felt that you could verify. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I remember you telling us a story regarding that. The candle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the candle. Right. So one of the things the Christmas after my husband died, he died in late July. And that fall, that Christmas, my oldest daughter, the one that I ended up um, having to kick out, gave me this candle. And it was like a healing candle. It was pink and had like paper wrapped around it and stuff. And um, I put it by my you know, on my um, nightstand right next to where I slept. And I noticed one night that there was like this little tiny glow in there. And it was kind of like a green, fluorescent, bright, you know, glow. And it was like, God, that's, you know, really odd. But every single night, originally, it kept glowing. And it was like, wow. And then I noticed as I started to heal, it didn't glow all the time. So some nights it wasn't there. Um, but when I was going through an emotional time or there was, you know, stress going on in the family, because my youngest daughter went through a really bad time um, after her dad died. You know, and all those things, it would glow and then it wouldn't glow. And it was like, it was like trying to tell me that I'm here, even though I'm not here. And one of the things that really, really, really hit home that I really believe that he, I don't know, that sounds silly, was in the candle. <laughs> <laughs> but the night of, we were, we had moved to Woodby Island, which is an island outside of Seattle. And my granddaughter was going to a Waldorf school there. And I was getting her, I was going to bed one night. And I had, I looked at my candle and I all of a sudden had this like huge crushing weight of grief that I'd never experienced. Not in the whole time he had been gone for, I don't know, a year and a half. To, no, probably two years by then. And it was like, really, I couldn't understand it. I mean, it was huge. And I just sobbed. And I wasn't like thinking about him. That's the thing that, you know, it wasn't like I was sitting, laying in bed, dwelling on his death or anything like that. So we get up the next day and I didn't let her, well, I didn't normally have television on and I drive her to school, which is like 45 minutes from where we were living. And I get there and I hear about 9-11. And the only thing that I can think of is that he was, and I, I guess selfishly, I love to think this, that he, that was his job, was that he was there to welcome all those souls into heaven because that's a mass amount of people at one time leaving the world. And yeah, it was just like freaky in some ways. But that candle is still in the family. Um, my youngest daughter, who's now 42, um, has seen the glow. My granddaughter kept it with her and she would see it glow. And my grandson has seen it and he's 12. So it doesn't glow as much, but I passed it on when I knew I didn't need it anymore. So I gave it to my granddaughter. What I find interesting about it is that the glow is green yeah. And in uh, esoteric spirituality, green is the color of the heart energy. I didn't know that. Yes. So, oh, how awesome. Oh, that uh, is so awesome. <laughs> yeah. So it could be um, very much so connected to the, whenever you have a feeling of grief, the way I've ever been able to come to terms with it and understand it is people feel like their heart is in some way wounded or they feel like there's a hole inside. And the way I've always understood it is that it's actually just a more complete opening in your heart that's there because maybe something, some physical energy has departed it in terms of a loved one. But okay. the, um, but the strength of the energy of your heart, you're now feeling coming in to fill that void. And that's why it feels so intense because, uh, 
It's actually how strong and open your heart is, not how wounded you are that makes it feel that intense. Right. I mean, I used to tell people, because they would ask me and I would just say that, you know what, your heart really can break. You know, that's, you know, they, it really, but it could just be the hole you're talking about. It's but the breaking of the armor around the heart that prevents us from feeling the true full depth of how we feel about others. Because I mean, if you really work to bring down that armor, you could feel that kind of deep, um, joyful and sorrowful feeling simultaneously about mm -hmm. anyone you care about, even if they're still alive. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like a, there's like, there's this filtration system that's normally working to keep us from the crushing intensity of how our hearts actually feel. Sure. Sure. That's, yeah. That's help. yeah. But that same thing also keeps people from compassionate acts as well. Unfortunately. Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, the other thing that happened actually happened, that's kind of a, a spiritual base. Um, but was actually before he died. My, um, I had a friend who was very much into angels and um, spirits and spirit guides and all that. And she one night came over to our house and she had a crystal. And you know how if you hold a crystal, it'll start going positive or negative. It'll go in circles. So we were playing around with it and we were doing it above the kid's head. Like a said, pendulum, right? Yeah, like a pendulum, right? So we put it above my husband's head and it started going around. And all of a sudden, this white light was on from the top of his head was going up through the crystal it was like really freaky and pam my friend and i looked at each other and we went oh my gosh because then i think i knew then that that was his spirit was starting to leave and um no one else saw it but her and i it was it was bizarre We've definitely had our share of strange crystals uh, experiences that are not really explainable by um, material science. Science. <laughs> I know I've worked. Uh, I've done like energy work with Haley before, mm -hmm. using crystals to relieve um, muscle pain and spasming from a car wreck that you got in. Mm -hmm. And um, at least one time in the past and it's happened more than just this time I'm thinking of, but at least one time with you, I was using crystal and it actually vibrated like a cell phone ringing. Well, it, it went off so to speak. And I was like, do you have your cell phone on you? And he goes, no. And I said, maybe it's under the couch cushions. So we lifted up the cushions uh -huh. and neither of our phones were there. They were both on the table. And oh, wow. he had, he had told me, he told me that it had happened to him previously before that. And I was like, no way. Cause I, I don't think I really would have believed him if he told me that a crystal vibrated until it actually happened. It was so oh. weird. It oh, was so weird. I was like purposefully that. sending energy through it, but I don't know how to consciously make something vibrate. I don't, maybe I like harmonize frequencies or something. <laughs> well, is that, do, have you studied, is it Reiki? Reiki? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm self-taught. So well, I know, I personally know that he's done a lot of reading about Reiki and he's uh -huh. been attuned before and I've seen him practice on people. So Attunement I, doesn't mean anything in my book. No, it doesn't. But I'm just saying, I think he's safe to call a certified Reiki practitioner in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I can make it not hurt anymore. Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, awesome. so I'll, I'll backtrack that, that statement about attunement okay. with, so like at music festivals we go to, um, and sometimes like uh, yoga studios will have this type of thing you might have someone come in and do Reiki attunements mm -hmm. and there's two kinds of Reiki attunements. There's the real kind. And then there's the kind where they charge you money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. So the kind where they charge you money, just avoid that altogether because you don't need it. And you, um, all that an attunement really can do for a person is help them decide that they're able to do it. That's it. So if you are, if you know that you're able to do it, you don't really need the attunement at which point all that there is to Reiki or energy healing, at least starting out until you develop your own mental constructs for how it works for you is to just have the intention and place your hands on or over somebody. And, um, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. You could you could try to radiate and feel love and compassion for that person. Or you could just in your mind say Reiki on and just try to internally feel the feeling of pushing energy out of your hand. There's no wrong way to do it other than to intend 
badly. I mean, yeah. what we are is our, our bodies are actually creating energetic field fields at all times. Uh, our entire physio physiology is electric in a sense. And our heartbeats actually create electromagnetic fields around us. And in that, that was kind of what I was thinking in regards to the candle is I wonder if there's something about the candle that is resonating with the frequency of the hearts of the people who are experiencing the, uh, I don't know, you know, who knows? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's all un, 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 unimportant to speculate about really, unless you actually have a way to do hard science. But. Well, it's, it's really, it's about, you know, cause what you're saying is really kind of like quantum physics, right? I mean, you, we really, I did an experiment one time cause I, um, I had a toothache and so I took a glass of, of water and I, you know, rubbed my hands together and I, and I pretended that or thought that that was energy going into the glass to heal my, my tooth. And it did, <laughs> it did you know, so we have such more cap capabilities than we allow ourselves. And to your point is like, it's really a matter of people making up their minds and they can do it. So when I look at my coaching, that's what I do. I help them make up their minds to do it. That's beautiful. Because that makes that's sense. all you can really do. And right. that's actually no different than what a healer does for a, a real healer does for somebody. Right. Um, not the used car repairman that most medical establishment doctors tend right. to act like if they don't actually behave that way. Uh, right. You know, uh, you have to, the other person has to activate the healing modality within their own body, right. within their own consciousness. And that's why there's such a thing called the placebo effect, mm -hmm. which I, f I find that to be an extremely annoying term because people throw that term out there and just be like, oh, this is yes, just the placebo do. effect. Like, <laughs> okay, that doesn't explain anything. <laughs> you, I mean, yeah, I you've named it something. What, why does it function that way? Because yeah. it's consciousness that um, generates the the rest of the experience that we're having physically right. and otherwise. I'll give you a current example. I was talking on the phone. I had actually looked for some help on Instagram because Instagram is one of those things that I haven't quite keyed in on how to use that to promote my business. Right. And so this person is a little bit more experienced. So I don't mind asking questions. A lot of people do, but it's like, I'm going to go to the people who know. Because why am I going to spend hours and hours and hours trying to figure it out? It's just a waste of my time. So we were chatting back and forth like we did on the plane. And um, she was telling me, telling me a little bit about her story, her life story. And I said, oh, have you shared that yet? And she, it was a pretty traumatic thing. And she goes, well, no, I, you know, and she started giving me all these reasons why not. And I said, well, why aren't you sharing it? You've got the beginning which is the situation that happened. You've got the middle, what you realize from that, and you've got the end, look where you've come. And she stopped and she went, oh my gosh, none of the other coaches have ever, ever told it to me that way. And I said, it's all right there. <laughs> and later she told me that she went ahead and, and she did a Facebook Live and told her, shared part of her story. I think uh, that's actually really huge with and trauma and hard things from the past is to uh to be able to share that kind of thing in balance because of course you don't want to just go around making it br bringing everyone down and telling everyone a sob right. story but well, there's a point in time where the opportunity will arise for the admission of whatever the thing is and right. admitting out loud is the same as admitting it within yourself internally which this uh, destroys that barrier that was separating you from a part of yourself, um, stealing your energy, making you a little less tired, you know, cause if you have enough of those, um, those doors in your mind that you have shut with the lights off and you won't go in there, then, mm -hmm. you know, there's still power going to those rooms. You're still paying the bill and right. you, <laughs> you need to get in there and look at it first before you can clean it up. Right. And you know, and pe what, what people don't, you know, her situation was, it was pretty traumatic, but you have to remember that everybody is individual. And so what I think people can look at my story and go, Oh my God. But to them, something could happen in their life, which I think is not, you know, personally, because of what I've been through might not seem as big, but I know that for them, it could be huge. If, does that make sense? Totally. And so we have to, 
have to understand that everybody is so individual. We're all so unique. We all face our lives in different ways and have different situations that happen that you can't say Linda went through more than chanced it. It doesn't work that way. I just went through my own stuff. You're going to go through, you're young yet. You're going to go through stuff. The difference is, is I'm 67. So I've gone through all the things that life can throw at you and you're just starting out. You you're know? quite so a remarkable will- individual for 67, <laughs> given the oh. state of affairs in our country right now. Yeah. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> Six, I'm actually 66. I won't turn 67 till next month. Well, but, er, happy, uh, happy early, early birthday. birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I believe in the country. I think that will turn around. I think we're going through some bad stuff, but. It's, I believe in people yeah. at least. I don't believe in I nations. Believe in they have not proven themselves <laughs> trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, well, that could be people, people always, you know, people ask me, well, what can I do? I said, well, you start at the bottom and you do grassroots movements. Cause that's what this country is built on. It's built it's, on a grassroots movement. <laughs> you guys listening right now. You're the grassroots movement. Actually. That's right. You're the ones, the reason we're even having this conversation is for you to look at your life and go, okay, I'm going to start that thing. Um, at least put in time every day towards whatever that thing is, that thing that's going to make my life better. Right. And that, you know, you bring up a good point and this is something that I work with people on is to make sure that they're not trying to do it all at once because when you have a change that you want to make in your life and it can be as simple as, I don't know how to make time for myself because I always feel guilty. Well, then don't do an hour, do five minutes, five minutes of just you time. That's it. That's it. Small steps. So when you, when you look at your big change, you break it down into small steps. You do the first step and you complete that because then you have a natural recognition of I accomplished the first step. That makes you feel good. So then you do the second step and you finish that totally. You don't do anything else, just that one. And then you go, I finished that second step. So by doing these small steps and completing each one, you're building your own self-confidence and you'll get to the end game. You'll get to that um, vision that you want to create. That's actually why in my perfect day, it starts out with making the bed because that's one small, easy, that's good right. thing you can do to give yourself a momentum towards a positive chain reaction. That's right. You're right. Absolutely. If you don't know what to do, just do something good, even if it's a small uh, thing, because you can only do one thing at a time anyway. If you forget to make the bed, how does it make you feel? Not that bad, but it's, it makes me feel good if I do do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> you feel better if you do it than if you don't. <laughs> Yep. Cool. Uh, it's been a blast getting to talk with you some more. Is there anything else you want to talk about in regards to uh, what you're doing? Maybe where people can look you up if they're interested in some coaching. Sure. They can look me up. I have um, my website is just Linda M clay.com and I'm on Facebook under Linda M clay. Um, no, Linda Marie clay on Facebook. Um, I'm I'll on make sure I link to all that. Yeah. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Google plus I'm on all the social networks. I'd love to hear from anyone that's interested in chatting more. It'd be great. It's cool because you're actually the second coach life coach that we had in a row, not even on purpose. It's just funny how those things work out. (laughs) Good, 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 good. And it was an entirely different kind of conversation too. Also in a good way. (laughs) Oh, that's good. I love this kind of conversation. I I think that there is definitely a, um, personally, I believe we are all here for a reason. And part of our journey is to find out what that reason is. And so sometimes the road is pretty bumpy and sometimes it's smooth. But I think that if we take care of each other and we serve each other and we help each other out, I mean, what a fantastic world it'll be. It's so, that easy. Yeah. Well, it's not. But <laughs> <laughs> we wish it would be that easy. But my job, my job is just to help people. I know that. So I really enjoyed talking with you both. 
It's so good to see you. Yeah, yeah I well, my, it was great to talk to you again too. The, it, we talked the whole plane ride. So. I know, I know. It was like awesome. I know. I told my sister. I, I, she was laughing because she doesn't. She's totally different than I am. And so I had the best conversation with two of the most wonderful people I've met in a long time. And I, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, it was awesome. Really, really yeah. pleased that you had me on here today. Yeah, it, it was super great. I. <laughs> I just knew that this would be the perfect type of conversation for an audience because who isn't going to feel inspired by listening to how valiantly you've overcome uh, challenges and you've not been identified with them and instead you're helping others identify with their true selves. Thank so you. thank you for the work you're doing in the world and your, thank you for your existence. And uh, I hope to be in touch con in the future and we can oh, even I do this so. again sometime. It would be great. I would love it. I would absolutely love it. So yeah, let's stay in touch. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye everybody. Bye. -bye.